Good morning and welcome to Jacksonville Perez. Uh, we're looking this morning at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And so we're just continuing on in our section-by-section -section reading of 1 Peter. A Christian, hear God's word to us. 1 Peter chapter 3. Likewise, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good, and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will endure forever. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Would you be seated and keep that Bible open as we study a, a very important passage. Uh, Father, uh, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that it is inerrant and it is uh, spoken by your very Holy Spirit. Uh, Father, we pray that we would see in this passage the examples that you would have us to follow. And Lord, we thank you that Jesus is our great example. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, well, two weeks ago, I uh, preached a sermon called Our Example, which was uh, based on just a few verses before this passage, and I suggested to you uh, that not only does Jesus guarantee our salvation when he died on the cross for us and promises us salvation through faith in him, uh, Peter also looks to Jesus's life of suffering for the sake of God as also an example for you and me as Christians to follow. Uh, so I suggested two weeks ago, last time I was preaching that Jesus Christ, his life is not just something that saves our soul, it's also something for us to follow as our example. And I get that word example right there in 1 Peter chapter 2. You can find it in just a few verses earlier than where chapter 3 starts. Uh, but Peter's going to continue on this idea of examples all throughout this next passage when he addresses men and women. And so as we dive into this, I want us to start to see what comes to mind for Paul, or excuse me, for Peter, when he is looking for examples of what the Christian life really looks like, all right? So keep this in mind, the whole context here is who are the examples we're supposed to follow. So with that, you know, I just want to ask you a question, you know, who are your examples of faith? You know, when you think about the people whom you model your life, who you have learned about Jesus Christ from, who are those examples that come to mind for you? Well, of course, as Christians, Jesus is our main example, right? I mean, he is the one we follow. We are followers of Jesus. He sets the standard that we try to aspire to. He is our example. We want to follow in his footsteps. But there are other Christians, and this is really the beauty of knowing church history and the beauty of being a part of God's community, the church, is that we also get people that we know that we can talk to or maybe books that we can read by them that can also be examples for us. So I don't know who your examples are, uh, but I know at least two come to mind immediately for me. The first one is a, a German pastor whom I've never met, but I can't wait to meet in the new heavens and new earth. His name's Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, I've thought many times about naming one of my sons Dietrich Bonhoeffer Jernigan, but I just love my kids too much to name them that. Uh, but I love Bonhoeffer, and uh, if you know anything about me, you know I've referenced him quite a lot. Uh, the other guy that I would really look to as an example that I, I read a lot and I study a lot, and uh, when I make the Ephraim co-op readings every week, I try really hard not to make like every prayer one of his prayers because they're just so good. Anyone want to take a guess who it is? He's African. Anyone know? An African Christian who lived in the 300s. St. Augustine. St. Augustine is the other guy that I really look to. Not that I think Dietrich Bonhoeffer or Augustine are perfect, right? Only Jesus is perfect. Uh, but these are guys whose example I follow uh, as best I can. And, you know, I think uh, for many of us, though, we may make it a little bit more personal. And I think if you think about your examples, I want to venture that they probably would fall into two categories, of, of types of people that you think of when you think about your example of the faith. Uh, this isn't a guarantee, but I'm willing to bet the first category you think of is your mother. 
Anyone here think of their mother as the prime example of a godly person who set an example for you? Kids, this is an easy time to win some brownie points if you're still in the room, okay? <laughs> easy time. The other group of people, besides mothers, not everybody's mother was a believer, but for many of us, we look to our mothers for an example of faith. The other group of people that you may uh, be prone to looking to are people who have uniquely suffered in this life. You know, it's not always the victorious people, the super successful people that we look to for our examples in life because honestly, they're intimidating and they seem really far away from us. The people that we most admire are typically people that have some scars and they've got some scar stories to share with you. And you know they've been through the ringer and they've come out of it stronger. So it's not lost on me that Dietrich Bonhoeffer, that German pastor that I mentioned, he ended his life by being put to death in a concentration camp by the Nazis because he opposed Hitler. He knew what suffering was and he personally experienced it. In fact, he was never able to marry his fiance. He died before he ever was able to marry her. He was a man who wrote and understood that following Christ required suffering. And he did so gladly for the sake of Jesus. St. Augustine at the same time, St. Augustine lived during the time of the collapse of the Roman Empire. Uh, his city was overthrown. And St. Augustine knew very intimately about suffering. In fact, his, his own child had died and he wrote about it in confessions. So all that to say, I bet if you think about who your examples are, I'm willing to bet it may be your mother or if it's not your mother, it's somebody you know has suffered profoundly. And the reason I mention that is because what we're seeing in 1 Peter chapter 2 and into 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter is writing to a group of Christians who are mistreated and insulted, who don't fit into their culture, who their culture does not accept their faith claims, and many, many people that they know no longer accept them the way that they used to. And Peter is saying, your primary example is Jesus Christ. And then Peter says, here's how that looks in the day to day. But notice that Peter doesn't say, follow my example as an apostle. Follow Bartholomew. Follow these great heroes of the faith who seem impervious to doubt or temptation or suffering. In fact, the people to whom Peter looks to are actually slaves, servants. He says, you want to know who's really following Christ? Servants. This is what it would look like suffering, being gracious to your master. And you know who else it looks like? The Christian wives in your congregations who are married to unbelieving spouses, who may mistreat them and disrespect them. Those are the examples that Peter goes to. It's fascinating that Peter goes there. So all that to say, this is an important passage, whether you're married or divorced or thinking about marriage uh, or you're single. Uh, I mean, the whole church congregation or whole community is, has a vested interest in a biblical understanding of marriage. We all benefit from this. This is one of God's institutions. So what is it that we're supposed to seek? Well, before we go into 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, because I think of where we are culturally and you know, um, what is already probably going through your mind when you read this passage, I probably need to say what this passage is not saying, and then sort of what it is saying, and then we can sort of walk through it together. So right off the bat, I probably need to say that this passage is not saying that if a husband tells his wife to abandon Christ, that she's obligated to do that, or that she should do it. This is not saying that the husband's authority over his wife is absolute, right? Uh, the, the beautiful thing about coming to Christ is there is a deeper loyalty, and it's actually quite fascinating that Peter is talking to believing women. He is addressing believing women whose husbands are probably not in the congregation. And he's speaking to them as Christians. And he says, your deepest loyalty is to Christ. Right? So, he's not, so Peter's not saying that it's okay for a wife to give up Christ to you know, follow her husband. You know, in this ancient world, it would have been uh, utterly shocking for a woman to not worship her husband's gods. It would, have seen, it would have been seen as deeply subversive and wrong for a woman to dare to not worship the gods that the husband worshiped. And so what Peter's saying is saying, you're not, don't, I'm not saying you should go back. You should stay loyal to Christ. There is now a deeper loyalty in everyone's heart who follows Jesus. 
Uh, the second thing you probably need to know about this passage is it is not saying that if a husband, you know, tries to compel his wife to sin or break God's law, that she's obligated to do that. Uh, you know, God has a, a deeper law that's higher and above all the other laws that no one should compel you to break or you are obligated to break, right? This is the same thing we talked about last week, right? Uh, submission for the Christian to the government officials, submission in our life is a default setting, but it's not absolute, right? If the government tells us to do something morally wrong or that's breaking God's rule, obviously, you know, to follow the apostles' examples in Acts, we follow God, not man, right? All right, so if the husband wants the wife to sin, she's not supposed to do that. Uh, you know, the husband's authority is not absolute. Uh, the other thing to know is this passage is not saying that if a husband abandons or abuses his wife, that she's just supposed to remain silent and accept that abuse. You know, God hates abuse in all of its forms, just like he hates all sin. And, you know, I hope it wasn't lost on you, but at the end of this passage, Peter even says that God will not hear the prayers of a man who mistreats his wife. I mean, talk about a warning for men to take seriously. He says, if you're not living in an understanding way, if you're not honoring her, you better shape up or God's not going to hear your prayers. So this is passage not saying that if people are being abused, that they're supposed to just suck it up and endure. Although that has been, it, this passage has been used to suggest that, but I don't think that go coincides with God's greater teaching about abuse and mistreatment and our uh, opportunities to get ourselves out of that. So, number four, last thing I'd say, this passage is not saying that a wife has no voice in a marriage or has no influence or power in a marriage. Uh, she obviously does. Uh, in some ways, uh, you know, the example that Peter's going to go to is very important for us to know. Uh, who does Peter go to for his example of a godly woman? Well, it's not Beyonce, right? And the godly man, the godly man is not James Bond, um, I jokingly say that because um, so much of your and my sort of ethical imagination, so much of our desire for the good life is shaped by our culture. And what I mean by that is like what is promoted in our, our myths that we tell ourselves, in the stories that we find attractive, in the movies that we watch, in the media, in the sort of cultural expectations we place on others and on ourselves, all of that is like the water that fish swim in. You know, we're not always aware of it, but it's everywhere. You know, if you really ask somebody who's like the manliest man, you know, who, who best represents manliness, you know, most people would probably say somebody like James Bond. You know, he sleeps with whatever woman he wants to. He kills a bunch of bad guys. He's always drinking cool mixed drinks. He travels the world. He has, you know, he only lives in an apartment when he has to, and he just sort of does whatever he wants, right? I mean, could, could that lifestyle, that, that cultural motif, right, that myth that that's what manliness is, could that be anything like Jesus, is that anything like the manliest man, the God who created masculinity? There's nothing at all, like, like at all that you should even aspire to a James Bond. I mean, you should take that myth out back in your house, nail it to the ground and shoot it in its head and watch the ants pick the bones clean. <laughs> your wife and your kids will thank you. That's not the image that we're supposed to have for what it is to be a man. What it is to be a man is to follow Jesus into story. Same thing for women. I mean, who's like the primo example? Beyonce. She isn't just, you know, the most fashionable lady. She is fashion herself. She rules the world. She's queen bee. She doesn't take grief from anybody. She doesn't put up with anything. She's empowered. She embraces her sexuality. She sells her own personal brand, right? I mean, these are all these sort of cultural ideas that whether we realize it or not, we are using those to define the beautiful, the true, and the good, Right? And the quicker you realize that, the quicker you're going to be in tune to see why it's so important for us to be in God's word and to let the inventor and the author of marriage tell us how to function in marriage and what it means to be a true human. Uh, women, who is your primary example of what it means to be a godly woman? Guess what? It's Jesus. Jesus was a man, but he is still the example that you are called to follow. You are a co-heir with Christ. You follow in his steps and no one else's. And the examples that we follow, the human examples, we only follow them to the extent that they resemble Jesus, right? That's what we admire in them, hopefully, is that they remind us, they smell like, they bring to memory things that Jesus himself teaches. So all that to say, um, in this passage, right, the, the primary example that everybody in this room should be thinking of 
is Jesus, is our primary example, whether you're a man or a woman. But that doesn't mean we don't have examples that we can look to in church history or in the Bible or people that you personally know. I mean, Peter will use Sarah as the example. And I love the the example of Sarah because this is why it's so important to fill your mind with the Bible stories and not just the cultural stories because they shape what you define as the good and the true and the beautiful and what's worthy of sort of modeling your life after, right? Well, you may not think that Sarah is worth modeling your life after, but, um, you know, Keep this in mind. Yeah, Sarah, you know, calls, uh, you know, Abraham Lord, meaning that was just an honorary title. It doesn't mean Lord like we would use the word today. It means she respected her husband, right? But think about this. Um, That does not mean that just because she was submissive to Abraham and followed him, that she didn't ever have a say or an influence or power in the relationship even. Um, I mean, Genesis 21.12 is an important passage when we consider the life of Sarah because in this passage, God tells Abraham something very specific. In Genesis 21.12, God tells Abraham, he says, whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. No amens on that one. That's, there we go. There we go. Funny no men said amen to that one, right? But what I love about that story, right, is it shows us that in, in, in marriage, there is an equality in marriage that just is inerrant to any healthy relationship, right? You are partners together. You are co-heirs. You are both going to receive the kingdom of God. You know, in Christ, there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, right? We're all equal at the foot of the cross. Uh, but even in this example of Sarah's life, she has influence over the relationship. And God can say, hey, buddy, whatever you do, whatever Sarah says to do, that's what you do, you know? Um, I like to think that Someone in the room, or maybe watching online, has just decided what their new needlepoint pillow is going to be for 2021, and maybe it's going to be a husband's gift for Christmas next year. You know, open it up. Whatever she says to do, do as she tells you. Genesis 21:12. Right? That's our new family verse for the year. Right? Here it is. And this, of course, coincides with much of, uh, you know, sound premarital counseling, right? Uh, what are the two most important words a new husband can learn? You're right. <laughs> Do as she tells you, right? So all that to say, those are the four things Peter's not saying. Now let's go into some things that I do think he's saying that I do think is important for us to understand. And I'll just sort of run through these quickly. Number one, Peter is telling Christian women, particularly Christian wives in this passage, to stay loyal to the Lord and not abandon the faith. All right, as I already sort of mentioned, in this ancient culture, it would have been deeply subversive for a woman to not worship the Greek gods that her husband worshiped. But What Peter says is when he's addressing these fellow Christians, he says, your deepest loyalty is to Jesus Christ. You may feel this pull to worship the gods of your husband, but you're not supposed to. You stay loyal to Jesus. All right, number two, Peter is telling Christian wives that sometimes, not exclusively, but oftentimes, our best evangelism is by our actions and not just our words. If you look in 1 Peter, it seems that Peter's, uh, whom he's addressing, it seems what is in Peter's mind is how are Christian women who have come to faith supposed to operate when their husbands do not know Jesus as Lord and they continue to worship all of the Greek and Roman gods? How is that woman supposed to operate? And this makes sense when you consider that in the early church, the church was primarily made up of women and slaves and people with not a lot of influence or power over society. And that continues to be the case for virtually every church in the world throughout time, that it is primarily more women involved than men. So that may explain why Peter spends more time talking to women in this passage, because that's who he's thinking about. He's thinking about these women who are asking and probably wondering, what am I supposed to do when my husband worships Zeus? And I'm supposed to honor and respect him, and yet I'm supposed to honor Jesus. Am I supposed to divorce him? Is that what, is that what a Christian woman's supposed to divorce their husband? Am I supposed to be subversive? Should I try to argue with him? Should I give him like the latest apologetics book? Should I email him some blog articles? You know, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to interact? And what Peter is saying is he says uh, very succinctly that, you know, you may win your husband over simply by your good conduct, But if you don't have the opportunity to speak to him, there are other ways that you can try to win him over to the Lord, right? He's talking to women who are trying to figure out, okay, how do I share the gospel with my husband, right? Does that make sense? 
All right, so the next thing to know that Peter is saying is, um, we, and we can't brush over this, he is telling these women that if they are married to unbelieving men, that that will and probably is most likely to produce suffering in their life, that there will be some suffering in their marriage. But, but Peter's main point to them is to continue to do good and to not live in fear. And that's when Sarah really starts to become the example is because she was always a courageous woman that always trusted in the Lord, that no matter what, God had them and had their family. All right, so Peter says, there may be suffering, but you need to trust in the Lord, just like he has told every Christian. He says, be subject to the emperor. Uh, Peter is not under any indication that that's not going to include some suffering, right? He understands, and he's telling us that suffering is just going to be part of our life. But we need to suffer with hope, Right? That's not an excuse to endure abuse. I'm not talking about that. What I'm saying is there is going to be suffering in life and our suffering can bring us closer to Christ. All right, you hear what I'm saying and what I'm not saying? Lastly, Peter is telling Christian wives that abuse, whether domestic or physical, is a sin and God hates it. I mean, that's why he warns the men that he will not hear their prayers if they do not honor and live in an understanding way with their wives. That's why he says it. I mean, think about the severity of that statement. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, abuse is wrong, whether it's the man or the woman in the marriage, right? But Peter seems to be focusing on the husbands. And he says, look, if you don't live with them in an understanding way, and if you don't honor them, even though you're physically stronger than them, know that your prayers will be hindered, All right? So Peter's not endorsing abuse. What he's saying is he's warning us against it. So let's dive into, so with all that, those sort of four things he is saying, four things he's not saying, hopefully that was helpful. So let's go into this passage and try to understand exactly what are we supposed to glean from Peter. So look with me at verse one, and we'll read through the first few verses, right? So let's take this one by one. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they're those unbelieving husbands, they may be won over without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. And don't let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Right, so let's look right off the bat. What is God's command to believing women married to unbelieving men. Well, his strategy for living this life as a sojourner is pretty consistent with what he's basically told every Christian starting in chapter two, which is we are called to live in submissive ways. And I know that word can be very hard for people, but whether we like it or not, submissiveness is a virtue that we are as Christians supposed to attain to. And what it means to be submissive is simply the idea that we respect authority whether we like it or not, whether we agree with them or not. Bing, somebody, the light bulb just went off in your head, <laughs> right? And I don't want to like play semantics, right? But there is, a, there is a substantive difference between obedience and submissiveness, Right? Like if I said, obey everything the emperor ever says, that's one thing. But if I say, submit yourselves to their authority and recognize that they have authority over you, there is a little bit of you know, wiggle room in how you define that. And you can still respect somebody's place of authority, but not obey every single thing they say. And of course, we know that in God's world, no human has absolute authority over anybody else. Ultimately, our greatest loyalty and our greatest submissiveness is to the Lord. And if anyone tells us to break God's law, we tell them a big N-O, right? But we are supposed to respect those in authority over us, right? That's part of what it means to be a Christian. And that's part of Peter's strategy for Christians. He says, look, we're going to enter in a world, we're sojourners. How are we supposed to operate? Are we supposed to overthrow the emperor? Are we supposed to say death to the emperor? No. We're supposed to follow Jesus, our example, who submitted himself to the authorities, who submitted to Pilate. Not that Jesus obeyed Pilate, but Jesus acknowledged Pilate's authority and then Jesus suffered for us, leaving us an example. But here's the key. Even though Jesus suffered for us, he always trusted himself to the Lord and knew that God was his deliverer. 
And that becomes our example as believers. It's not that other people have absolute authority over us, but as Christians, we can't wiggle out that we are gonna suffer in this life, but we suffer in a Christian way. We suffer like Jesus, where we bless those who curse us. We don't hate our enemies. We love our enemies and pray that God would redeem them. We understand that as, as Paul says, our enemies are ensnared by the devil to do his will. And we need to pray that God would grant them repentance, leading them to obedience that leads to life. I mean, that's the Christian understanding of life. We don't hate anyone and we don't certainly hate our enemies. We love and pray for them. And we realize that we were once sinners and saved not by our righteous deeds, but because of Jesus' blood shed for us. I mean, when the gospel works its way down into the deep recesses of your heart, you start to see that grace and forgiveness, extending grace and forgiveness is one of the most powerful things we do in this life because that's what changed us from the inside out. And of course, grace always leads to repentance, right? It leads to a change in life, right? Uh, you know, that's why I suggest that grace and repentance are like the two, you know, shoes that you wear in the Christian life. You know, you shift your weight to grace and grace leads you to repent of your sin. And as you repent of your sin, you realize how hard it is. <laughs> and so you lean back on grace. And then your God's grace again motivates you to do away with sin in your life. And then as you try harder and harder, you realize that the power to remove sin from your life is not in your effort, it's in relying more and more on God's grace. Does that make sense? That's how the gospel works itself out, right? And that's why suffering is just gonna be part of life. So what is it then, you know, that we're supposed to see? What is Peter saying to these women? Well, like I already said, you know, part of the answer is he's saying, how are you supposed to evangelize your unbelieving husband? You know, there may be opportunities to talk, but apparently Peter is under the impression that it's probably not gonna work. So what are you supposed to do now? Well, Peter says, live, a, you know, a, a godly lifestyle. Respect him, even though you don't agree with him on this. And who knows, maybe eventually God will call him. After all, it's God, not people, right, who draw people to Jesus, right? Faith is a gift that God gives us, right? We believe in a God who elects his people. That's what Peter says in the very first words, right? So we know that the way somebody becomes a Christian, we have a part, but ultimately it's God who calls them, right? So that's the hope that a Christian wife has when she's married to an unbeliever. Ultimately, God is going to have to do something in his life. And of course, the same holds true if you're a believing husband and your wife doesn't believe, you know, sometimes, you know, the person you are, you know, you should most listen to isn't the person you listen to, right? Maybe your spouse doesn't want to hear about it from you. What then? Should you resent them? Well, Peter says, no, you may just need to suffer and pray and trust that God calls those whom he will call. So let's go more into sort of what uh, Peter is, is doing in this passage. So the first thing you need to know uh, is that Peter is actually dignifying servants and slaves and women and all kind of people who don't have positions of power. You know, uh, Karen Jobes is a, uh, a PhD. She taught at Westmont College for many years, and she just retired from Wheaton College. Uh, Karen Jobes is a Greek scholar. She's very smart. And uh, she wrote in her commentary on First Peter, she said, how ironic it is that the words that these first century slaves and women would have read as affirming and empowering are now criticized by some as enslaving and as oppressive. Uh, you know, most of the time in, in this ancient world, women and slaves would never even been addressed. You know, if you were writing a letter, you know, to a group of people, you wouldn't even bother to speak to the women or the slaves, right? Why would you bother to uh, speak to the men? And yet Peter directly addresses the women. He dignifies them tells them to do good, don't live in fear, stay loyal to Christ. And he tells slaves, uh, for the record, whom a third of humanity was enslaved at this time in either indentured servanthood or slavery or, or some kind of household slavery. He's talking to a, a vast group of people and he's dignifying them. And he's speaking to the whole church and he says, you know who the examples are? The people who are suffering. The people who are suffering, those are the ones you should be looking to as your example. Does it make sense? So first off, he's, he is dignifying the women. The second thing you need to know, uh, I guess, what is this supposed to mean for us, is one of the things this means is that for many, many people, many, many men particularly, some even in our own congregation, will one day enter heaven because of the faithful, 
courageous, loving, and sacrificial love of their wives. I mean, think about that. How many men were led to Christ because of the faithful reliance of their wives? There's people whose testimony is that in our congregation, it was the godly women who loved their husbands, who followed their leadership, but knew their deepest loyalty was to Christ and prayed that God would one day work in a way that they never could. And God answered their prayers. I mean, those are the examples that Peter is pointing us to look to. So there are men all over this world that owe their salvation to their wives, right? That's what Peter's hope is, right? That's why he says, wives, you know, be subject to your husbands, even those who don't obey the word, so that you can win them over to Christ. But it may not be by your words anymore. It may be by your conduct. Right, the second thing we need to understand uh, for what this means is that if Jesus Christ is your core identity, if he is your core identity, then there is a downplaying of the importance of our outward appearance. I mean, how much of our society, and even in the society that uh, Peter was writing in, was always defined on our external looks, right? I mean, what does it really mean to be me? Well, uh, what Peter says is don't worry so much about the external. Instead, focus on the inner beauty. I mean, I mean imagine, I know that may sound like crazy and oppressive. Peter's not saying you can't wear gold or do your hair. What he's saying is he's saying, what is your adorning? What is the thing that you focus on, that you cultivate, that you worry about, that you focus your heart and your mind and attention on? Is it the external or is it the internal beauty of a soul that is open and knows the Lord? I mean, what, 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 do you, you know, what should Peter say? Just make sure you're always good looking, right? Always be dolled up. I mean, is that what we want the Bible to say? Is that the advice you want to give to our daughters? Always look great. no. I think what we would want to people to say, and we understand is more in line with biblical truth, is that the real beauty of a person is what's inside of them, right? I mean, think about it this way. And I think this, you know, this counts for men and women because men are pretty vain too, and now more so probably than ever, right? But I guess when I, when I think about this, I'm like, am I being vain? You know, I think, about, I think about it in a couple ways. Maybe this works for you, maybe it doesn't. But I think, how, how particular am I about my coffee. Like on a scale of one to 10, how particular do I want my coffee? You know, I, I would probably modestly say it's like a 9.5. Because if you put sugar in my coffee, I don't just throw it away. I throw it away with disdain. And then I contemplate your morality. I'm like, you're the kind of person that would put sugar in your coffee? You think I'm that kind of person that I would put sugar in my coffee? You know? And then, you know, my wife is like, you drink non-organic coffee? We are very particular about our coffee. And think about how silly that is, right? I mean, um, one of the questions that I have every Sunday morning is, have I been more specific? I know this is going to be hard to believe, but I think about, am I more specific about the way I want to look and dress and how I want my hair to look? I know it doesn't look like I do my hair, but I do. It's just a big bird's nest, but it's very hard to make it look like a bird's nest every week. If you don't believe me, ask Bob Dylan. It takes a lot of work to look this messy. But I ask myself, am I being more particular about my external appearance than I am about being particular about what God's word is actually saying? What, what am I more nervous about? Getting my coffee wrong or getting God's word wrong? Those are all silly examples, right? And they're over the top, but I think that's similar to what Peter is saying. He says, what is your adorning? What is the thing you want to be really specific on? Is it the external or is it the internal? And for Christians, it's the internal. We need to be cultivating virtue, which is just our habits, our character. Those are the things that we're supposed to be focusing on. If we're going to be particular about anything, those characteristics living like Jesus. Those should be the things that excite our imagination, right? Those should be the things that we love. And this is why it's so important for you to recognize who are your examples that you're living after. I mean, if you really think James Bond is the most classic example of manliness, that is going to shape everything about your life because that's ultimately what your heart longs to be, right? And so anything that doesn't make you look super toned, or, or super sexually promiscuous, or, or super attractive, or super cool, is going to be a threat to your very identity because you've made a non-biblical category your ideal. And everything about Christianity is going to be, mm, I don't like that. I don't like that. That's not who I am. I want to be this. 
Same thing works whether you're a man or a woman. Who is that example? Because that's really where the back of your mind, what you daydream about, that's where your heart goes. Who is that example? Who do you most want to be like? Who excites your imagination, right? And for the Christian, it's Jesus Christ who had no form or majesty that we should think anything of him. Instead, he was despised and rejected. And yet, who here wouldn't want to be more like Jesus? What excites your imagination? Who's that example? Well, continuing on the idea of example, Peter then goes to Sarah. Uh, you know, uh, how is Sarah the example? Well, the important thing to know when you read the book of Genesis, uh, really anything in the Bible, is that the Bible often describes things, but it doesn't always prescribe things, right? So what I mean by that is the Bible can tell a story about a person, but it's not always endorsing what that person does, right? The Bible is a history in a sense that it tells us the story of God's people, but that doesn't mean everything that a person does in the Bible is supposed to happen. I mean, just take David's example when he sleeps with Bathsheba. You're not supposed to say, well, he, he, there's a man after God's own heart. I guess I should do the same thing. We all understand that that's a description of David's life. And we're supposed to say, well, is he following the Lord or is he not? Well, the sad thing is when you read the Bible, it's very hard to find a perfect person in the Bible who doesn't let us down in some ways. But that's also part of what the Bible is doing to make you ache and yearn for Jesus. Wouldn't it be great if there was a king who would fight, a, fight Goliath for us? Wouldn't that be great? I mean, that's what the story of David and Goliath and Saul is all about. Saul was supposed to be the king. He was a head taller than everybody and he was so handsome. And God's people demanded a king who would fight for them. And then a, a giant comes along, and what does Saul do? <laughs> He's afraid. He fails. Don't you want a king who fights Goliath for you? So God raises up David, who's the youngest of the brothers, who's kind of short and has a ruddy complexion. And God can use him to defeat Goliath for you. But wouldn't you have wanted the king who would fight your battle for you? You see, these stories are making us yearn for the king who won't fail us. It's making us yearn for who our true king is, God himself, who came in human form as Jesus and shows us what it means to live fully human. He's the author of marriage and he's the author of humanity and he's the only example we can really truly pattern our lives after that will cohere and not break down over time eventually. I mean, what is our external adorning, if not trying to reverse the effects of aging. It's a losing battle, right? What if there's something else we're supposed to be focusing in on? So how is Sarah the example? Let me sort of get back to that. How is Sarah the example? Well, Peter seems to think Sarah's the example because she followed Abraham's call, right? And that doesn't mean that everything Abraham ever did was right or in Sarah's best interest. Frankly, it probably wasn't a lot of the time. But the example, the thing that he wants you to focus on with Sarah is she was committed to doing good to Abraham her whole life and she did not fear anything that was frightening. You know, Sarah, if you read the book of Genesis, Sarah's, you know, she's not afraid to share her opinion. And of course, remember, God tells Abraham at one point at least to do everything she says to do, right? Uh, she has an influence over the marriage, but what she is is she's an example of a courageous woman who trusted that even when Abraham makes some bad decisions, even when Abraham seems to have some shaky decision-making, Sarah's root belief is that God is going to get our family through this. She did not fear anything that could have caused a normal person to be afraid, and that's what makes her the example. It's not that she's morally perfect any more than St. Augustine was morally perfect. The only one who's truly perfect is Jesus Christ, and he's our primary example. But we can see in God's people and throughout time examples that we should model. So for wives married to unbelieving men, what I would say is trust that God is going to get your family through this. Trust him. Have a faith that is unshakable. And it's not rooted in anything except that God is true, he is good, he is beautiful, and he is faithful. And you know that because you've seen it in Jesus Christ. So, you know, that all asks the question, you know, what about husbands? Well, 
Uh, what I would say, just so you know, when it comes to the Bible, um, some passages focus more on telling husbands what to do, and 1 Peter chapter 3 focuses more on speaking to women and to the wives. Well, the reason I think there is, like I suggested, Peter's probably writing to churches that were predominantly made up of women. But if you read Ephesians chapter 5, for an example, Paul has a whole lot more to say to men than he does women. So if you just read Ephesians, you would think, I guess the Bible's ignoring women. It's not. It's just this passage focuses more on men. This one focuses more on the women. But that doesn't mean that Peter doesn't have some things for men to focus on. So what is it that Peter wants Christian husbands to focus on? And here, it doesn't, he's not speaking whether or not the husband, uh, you know, is necessarily always married to a believer, right? That seems to be more of the question for the women. Uh, it seems like he's probably saying, Christian husbands, how are you supposed to treat your Christian wives? But, um, you know, let's just go into that with that kind of the, that understanding. It's a little bit different. Christian husbands, how are you supposed to treat your wives? Number one thing he says, look at verse seven. Live with your wives in an understanding way. So that understanding could refer really to two things. One, understand your wife, which full disclosure will take you a lifetime to do. No amen on that one. All right. Uh, live in your wife in an understanding way, which means in a sympathetic way, in a tender way. And then of course, in an understanding way also means understand what God's will is for husbands, right? Understand that, you know, this is what God expects of you as a husband. So what does it mean to, you know, to live in an understanding way? Well, you could do a lot worse than read that great book, His Needs, Her Needs. Uh, it's, not, it's not based, you know, it's not a Bible book. It's not a book of the Bible, but it's got some good advice. And they say, in an understanding way, husbands have, uh, you know, a call to fulfill sort of five needs that a wife has. Anyone read that book, His Needs, Her Needs? The five core needs of a wife are these. Affection, conversation, openness, and honesty, financial security, family commitment. So if you want to know, sort of generally speaking, what does your wife need? What does it mean to be understanding to your wife? Well, it means show her affection, be kind to her, have conversation with her, be open and honest with her, give her financial security, and be committed to the family. You could, that's pretty much what it means to live in an understanding way with your wife. There's more, but that's a pretty good start. And then, of course, he goes on and he says, not only should you live in a sympathetic and understanding way, he then tells the Christian men to honor their wives. To, so to regard their wives with honor and dignity, right? Not to see them as below you, right? As some sort of, you know, like weak person that you, you know, condescend down to, but instead to honor her. And, and when he says honor her as the weaker vessel, don't get too tripped up on that phrase. I think all that Peter's really referencing is simply that women generally are not as physically strong, and at least in this culture, and many times today, are not generally as able to exert power and influence over certain things. You know, in this culture, almost all the men worked, the wives stayed at home, right? So he's saying, look, they don't have as much power as you do to influence certain things, and then generally you're stronger than her. So that does not mean, though, that you should bully her or mistreat her. Instead, you should recognize that she's worthy of your honor and you should tenderly care for her. Yeah, you are privy to some things that she's not. You know, generally you have more upper body strength, right? Generally. But that doesn't mean you should abuse her or mistreat her. You should tenderly care for her, right? It's not a right to domineer or bully it is the call of Jesus Christ to stoop and serve and honor your wife. But of course, who is the great model? Well, Jesus is. And Jesus says, don't lord your authority over anybody. And in fact, Jesus' example of what he does by that is, well, how does he teach the disciples not to lord authority over each other? Well, on the night that they would abandon him, Jesus got down on his knees and washed their stinky feet. He washed their feet clean and said, this is my example. This is humble leadership. Go and do likewise. You know, in Ephesians, that longer passage on men, you know what it says about men? I love this. He doesn't say to wash their feet. He says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her with the washing of water with the word. 
Christian husbands, we love and we serve our wives and we wash them clean with the word of God. That's what we do. We stoop, we serve. And of course, lastly, you know, Christian men are supposed to see their wives in a specific way, shaped not by culture or cultural ideals of what the woman should be like or what the man should be like. We see each other only in light of Jesus Christ. And we see them as co-heirs with us. We see them as they are going to receive just as much of the kingdom of God in the new heavens and earth, in heaven itself as we are. We are co-heirs with our wives. Look what he says. He says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Men are supposed to see their wives as heirs equal at the foot of the cross, right? And that, that leads us not to dishonor, but to honor, right? To treat them with dignity, to listen to them, right? To see them like Abraham saw Sarah. When she was right, she was right. When God says, listen to her, I should listen to her, right? So let me just finish up. I know we got to get going. You know, uh, who, are, who are your examples of faith? You know, have, have people been coming to mind that you think model this? Um, you know, when I think about my favorite model, St. Augustine, uh, you know who his model was? I mean, besides Jesus, you know who, you know who St. Augustine looked to? There's a city in California named after her. Santa Monica. St. Augustine always, always, in all of his writings, he always looked to his mother as the primary example of what it means to be a Christian. And in Confessions, Augustine says these words about his mother. She served her husband as her master and did all she could to win him for you, Lord, speaking to him of you by her conduct, by which you made her beautiful. Finally, when her husband was at the end of his earthly life, she gained him for you. Friends, who's your example? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you give us so many examples to follow, but primarily you give us your son, Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, we pray that husbands would love their wives as Christ loved the church. Lord, we pray that wives uh, who are married to unbelievers, Lord, that they would trust themselves to you and know that you have their family in your hands. And Lord, we pray that we would continue to see husbands come to know you through the faithful conduct and witness of their wives. Uh, Lord, we pray that many people would come to faith in this church and that we would set all of our heart and our imagination and our hopes in you alone. In Christ's name we pray, amen.